Coming here today reminds me that my book, Disciplined Minds, was also stolen from New York University. The library here isn't open to the public, but uh, I used a scam to get in and do research many times while I was writing the book. Like other big libraries, the library here gets government publications free under the, under the condition that it make them available to the... So I would tell the guards that I wanted to look at the government publications and they would let me in. I think once I even did look at the government publications. <laughs> I mention that just to introduce an irreverent attitude toward universities because I think that's the attitude we need to properly discuss academic freedom. Today I will argue that the biggest threat to academic freedom is disuse. By disuse I mean that the people who have academic freedom rarely use it. And I will argue that this disuse is no accident because academic freedom is given to the people who are the least likely to use it. And because academic employees don't need academic freedom to do what they are hired to do. To determine whether or not someone is actually using academic freedom, we need to think about what academic freedom means in practical terms. All salaried professionals, from architects to doctors to journalists, are given some freedom to choose what they will work on, some freedom to decide how they will do their work, and some freedom to express their views. But that's not academic freedom because their employers can veto anything they do or fire them for it. You have academic freedom only to the extent that you can work on topics that your employer would otherwise not allow you to work on, and to the extent that you can do your work in ways that your employer would otherwise not permit and to the extent that you can express your views, express views that your employer would otherwise not allow you to express. Only one group of salaried professionals is given academic freedom, uh, and that's professors or faculty members. The most striking thing about academic freedom is that few faculty members ever use it. Academic freedom plays no role in the day-to-day -day work of the overwhelming majority of faculty. And so academic freedom has only a small constituency. We are losing it because we are not using it. Let's look at why academic freedom is so rarely used. Let's start with a little poll here to see how many people here at the Academic Freedom Conference have ever used academic freedom themselves. If you have ever spoken out on spoken out or done something else at work that would have gotten you into trouble or fired if the academic freedom rules had not been there to protect you please raise your hand <laughs> most professors however go their entire careers without ever using academic freedom professionals in general are intellectually and politically timid for example, most professionals go their entire lives without using their First Amendment right of free expression. That is, they never once speak out in a way that would get them into trouble with power if the free expression laws weren't there to protect them. The reason why academic freedom is so rarely used can be traced back to the fact that work in general and professional work in particular is an inherently political activity. This contradicts the usual view, which is that technical work is not necessarily partisan but is often corrupted by politics. In, in the Dilbert comic strip, for example, work is always corrupted by politics. When I say work is political, I mean it affects the distribution of power in society. The, the work of salaried professionals is politically sensitive because it involves decision-making in which their employer's interests are at stake. Thus, the product of professional labor is political. It takes sides the journalist's angle on a story, the accountant's bookkeeping decision, the lawyer's choice of contract language, the historian's depiction of events, the scientist's decision about what to research, the minister's sermon, uh, the welfare worker's finding, even the speech writer's joke, professional work tilts one way or the other, but the way it tilts is, is never an accident. 
The professional is someone employers can trust to tilt in the right direction, to act in a way that is politically correct from the sponsor's point of view. Professionals maintain what I call ideological discipline in their work. That's what distinguishes them from skilled non-professionals. Salaried professionals are workers who have been hired to carry on intellectual labor under the guidance of an assigned ideology. Of course, I call upon employees to openly question the assigned ideology, to be politically insubordinate. That's when academic freedom would come in handy. I think everyone should have academic freedom. I sure could have used it. Such independent thinking would be a big change. The typical liberal professor, for example, remains silent on close to home issues, such as union busting or other repression at his or her own university. And you rarely hear a word from professionals of any sort in favor of a more democratic distribution of power in society or in the workplace. And uh, it's great that we have so many exceptions in this room today, but the number of exceptions overall is small. College professors are among the most left-leaning of all professionals, yet few are radicals and most of the radicals are not activists. Universities are institutions of the status quo. That should be no surprise given that their boards of trustees are typically made up of business people and their allies. For example, if you look at who is on the board of governors of the University of Ottawa, which I had reason to look at recently, you will see that Denis Roncourt was basically fired by a gang of bankers and their friends. Uh, the, these boards of trustees, boards of governors, boards of regents, these are the people who would be the least likely people to want to upset the hierarchy of power in society. They have an interest in even more centralization, bigger monopolies, more media control, globalization of their system, and so on. Universities produce ideology and people, both of which are needed to maintain and degrade the status quo in society. The corporations need ideology that treats their power as legitimate, and they need educated, obedient employees. University faculty are hired to produce the ideology and people. They call that work research and teaching. respectively. That's politically sensitive work and university bosses don't trust just anybody to do it. There's a lot of weeding out on the road to tenure. And we, and we do need to focus on tenure because professors don't really have academic freedom until they have the protection of tenure. Tenured professors are people who have been selected through multiple rounds of processing and scrutiny. As undergraduates, they jumped through all the hoops to meet their institution's graduation requirements. They made it through graduate school, which is a repressive intellectual boot camp emphasizing conformity. Any graduate students here? Not many. They're too busy doing their uh, assigned work, I guess. <laughs> There's about a 50% dropout or kickout rate for students entering PhD programs, and this weeding out is not politically neutral. To put it bluntly, the programs favor ass kissers, students with a politically subordinate attitude, those who will, who will be the best servants of the status quo. Professional training is abusive because it, it works to, it attempts to break individuals into playing a politically subordinate role to ready them for employers. Independent thinkers are given a hard time. Our future tenured professors went a step further as graduate students by tailoring themselves to conform to the expectations of the gatekeepers of tenure track jobs. And finally, they went through the tenuring process itself, which is another years-long process of working to please others and weeding out. So professors are professionals who have additional free expression protection, the academic freedom, but they are selected through additional rounds of scrutiny. 
Those who remain after the multiple and protracted rounds of weeding and transformation are so intellectually and politically timid that they don't need the protection that tenure provides. Thus, the people who need academic freedom don't have it, and those who have it don't need it because they have nothing provocative to say. So the intellectual and political timidity of professors is one reason why academic freedom is rarely used. Uh, the other big reason why academic freedom is rarely used is that intellectual workers don't need academic freedom to do what they are hired to do, which is to serve the hierarchy of power. Uh, mainstream intellectual workers don't need political freedom to do their creative work. And they don't demand that their employers allow them to exercise political freedom in their work. Only when intellectual workers have an independent political agenda do they need and demand freedom, because only then might their creative work displease their employers. Scientists are a good example. During Joseph Stalin's reign of terror in the Soviet Union, tens of thousands of scientists and engineers were arrested, imprisoned, and sometimes even executed. Yet, Soviet science advanced rapidly and came to lead the world in many fields, including mathematics and theoretical physics. Until the mid-1950s, some of the Soviet Union's most eminent scientists worked in prison laboratories. At the height of the repression, Soviet physicists did work that later won them five Nobel Prizes. One of these physicists, a Soviet citizen named Peter Kapitza, had been living in England for 13 years when upon a routine visit to the Soviet Union to attend a conference, Soviet, Soviet authorities seized him on Stalin's orders and wouldn't let him return home to England. Within a few years of that kidnapping, Stalin had Kapitza running a Soviet laboratory and doing the most creative work of his career. When the young physicist Andrei Sakharov was sitting at his desk at Azimov 16 doing his famous work in theoretical physics, he would gaze out the window and see brutal armed guards with dogs marching rows of political prisoners to their jobs at the scientific installation which was the Soviet equivalent of Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States. Uh, years later, Sakharov became a dissident, and that's when he described what he saw out the window. But it was unusual for a scientist to become a dissident in the Soviet Union. Even when the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse, the leaders of Soviet science sided with the old order. Scientists don't need academic freedom to do their creative work. They just need funding. This is true for service intellectuals in all fields, not just science. Intellectual workers don't need academic freedom to service the status quo, which is what they have been hired to do. But they do need academic freedom to do what they should be doing, which is questioning what they have been hired to do and working instead in the public interest. If salaried intellectual workers want to make a difference in the world, if they want to make the world a better place, then they have to do things beyond the service work that they have been hired to do. That's what activists do, things that they weren't hired to do. The way to defend academic freedom is to use it and spread it to more people. Service intellectuals need academic freedom so that they can work in the public interest. Linking academic freedom to the public interest like that is the only way to get public support for academic freedom. To make that link, people who have academic freedom have to use it prominently in the public interest. That will give ap academic freedom a reputation as something that serves the public rather than as something that gives job security to an elite. The bigger the disparity between the rights of workers who have academic freedom and the rights of workers who don't, the harder it is to defend academic freedom. So we need to take the position that everyone should have academic freedom. The workplace is where people have their biggest interaction with society, and so that is where it is most important that they have the right to express their views. Uh, part of academic freedom is the freedom to decide what to work on. I will argue that professors don't use that part of their academic freedom either just like the freedom of expression part.
professors <laughs> are said to be self-directed in their research, but who really determines the topics that they work on? To ask who determines the topics is to ask who in society professors serve in their work. Let's look at science professors as an example. A scientist's research can go in any of a vast number of scientifically interesting directions at every juncture. Which of these directions does the scientist deem most interesting? Might it be a direction that holds promise for attracting the interest of a funding agency or a potential consulting client or for pleasing reviewers in a peer review system that favors the status quo? In Disciplined Minds, I quote the boss of a major corporate research facility that employs more than 500 PhD scientists and engineers. He says, quote, you can't select problems for true scientists, much less tell them how to attack the problems, but you can make sure that they are fully informed of the needs of the company businesses that pay the bill, end of quote. Well, university scientists are just as aware of who is paying the bill. Professors are directed in ways that allow them to think of themselves as self-directed. Consider unsolicited grant proposals as an example. These research plans are created completely by the researchers. However, the scientists know that most proposals are rejected. The National Science Foundation, for example, rejects nearly 30,000 of the 40,000 proposals it receives each year. That rate is typical for funding agencies. So professors who want to do research inevitably have funding agencies' interests in mind as they plan their work and write their proposals. Consciously or unconsciously, they tilt their interests toward those of the sponsors. And the sponsors know this. For example, the Office of Naval Research, which is a big funder of basic physics in the United States, says this, quote, although contracts are usually awarded in response to unsolicited proposals, ONR makes every effort to publicize its research needs so that its programs and interests can be taken into account by prospective contractors." End of quote. Thus, funders find they can arouse the proper research interests in scientists without saying very much. Their money talks and is brilliantly articulate. But they have people who talk, too. The Office of Naval Research describes its program officers as people who, quote, maintain long-term relationships with investigators, giving ONR an invaluable ability to apply relatively small investments early in the conceptual stages of a project with great influence on the focus of the work, end of quote. So scientists and other professionals have what I call assignable curiosity. If the Air Force Office of Scientific Research were to make $50 million available to universities for basic research in lasers, then university professors would do $50 million worth of basic research in lasers. In general, scientists and other salaried professionals control the technical means of their work, but not, not its social goals. Of course, it doesn't have to be that way, and I call upon professors to use their academic freedom to take control of the social goals of their work. 